So I'm excited to, uh, to inaugurate this session with our first speaker, Reed Johnson. He's an associate professor in the OSU Department of Entomology, where he teaches researchers, researches and does outreach, uh, mostly related to honeybees, but other bees as well. Uh, Reed's background is in toxicology. And so he looks at some of the um, pertinent pesticide issues happening with bees, mostly honeybees, but also other bees, uh, bumblebees and others. He's done a lot of work with queen issues in um, almonds in California, um, leads lots of seminars um, here in Ohio, teaches undergraduates about uh, beekeeping, and, um, and also looks at things like corn dust, um, tank mixes, and other relevant pesticide issues. Um, but this morning, he's going to talk about the um, honeybees in the city and also those, uh, those gradient areas, suburbs and, and um, uh, rural areas. Uh, where are they foraging? What are they eating? So, Reed, I'm really excited to have you here with us this morning. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, let me, Marsha, I might need your help to stop my sharing. And switch over to Reed. All right, thanks, Denise. Uh, thanks for it's it's an honor to be uh, the, uh, the starting this uh, this short seminar series here. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I'm. Yeah. The question is, what are bees foraging on in the city? Which I think is a very relevant um, topic leading into the the other topics that you'll be uh, learning about over the course of the week. I do work primarily on honeybees. Um, of course, honeybees are are not native to North America, and I'm sure you'll you'll hear that again in the upcoming uh, presentations. There are 20,000 other species of bees worldwide, including 3,500 here in North America. Most of these are solitary bees um, nesting in the ground or in in uh, twigs or stems. Um, but I specifically am am somewhat obsessed with honeybees because they're such fascinating animals, despite the fact that they're they're not native here. But they are really important pollinators of a lot of the the, the food that we eat. Here's a picture that I took out in the Central Valley of California, showing that uh, just a few of the colonies involved in that great migration of honeybees out to California to pollinate the almonds, uh, and almonds consume about 80 to 85% of the managed honeybee colonies in the entire United States in order to pollinate uh, this crop to make those very tasty almonds that, uh, that I certainly enjoy eating. But beyond their, their agricultural significance, I think honeybees are just fascinating because as a, as a large social superorganism, there's just so much going on in there. It's, it's, it's probably as close as you can get to seeing an alien civilization without traveling off the planet because th there's just so much activity, so many things we really don't understand about how the bees are, are interacting with each other and the environment around them. And Denise mentioned that I was interested in toxicology and that's a lot of what my research program is involved with. But what we found is that it's hard to understand the toxic exposure that bees receive from pesticides without knowing where they're going and which flowers they are really most interested in visiting. Because one of the key ways that we can protect uh, honeybees and all bees from pesticide exposure is by uh, making sure that pesticides don't get applied to flowers that are in bloom or that might be attractive to bees. So that led to the question, well, which, which flowers are attractive to bees? And that's a, it seems like it would be obvious which, which flowers bees are going to, but it's actually uh, a relatively understudied area. There's been a lot more work more recently, but uh, that's that's really what got us into this question of of what bees are foraging on in in both urban agricultural any place that that honeybees might be what is it that they're they're most attracted to of course this could uh, lend information to ways to conserve other bee species by using similar techniques to look at uh, solitary bee foraging or or honeybees and other bees may share similar preferences for some flowers opens a lot of questions, and I think it's a, a really interesting avenue of research. But because I'm the, the only honeybee speaker here, I'm going to just give you a little bit of brief background about, about honeybees, because um, I think they are really fascinating. I just want to get a little basic information out there to help you understand some of the stuff I'm going to be presenting later. So those, those boxes of, of bees we saw in almonds, they contain uh, three different types of bees. They contain, of course, the, the queen, who is the 
reproductive individual within the colony. She's about twice the size of the workers that you see down here. And the queen is responsible for all of the egg laying that goes on in that colony. Um, both the, the workers and the queens are females, um, but the, the only female that can lay eggs that will develop into new workers is the queen. Um, then there, of course, are the workers. These are the bees you're most uh, commonly seeing on flowers. Uh, the queen never really exits the hive unless it's to, to go on a mating flight. And the workers, as the name suggests, do all the work in the colony, both in maintaining the, the indoor environment, as well as going out to forage on those, those flowers that we're interested in figuring out which, which flowers they're, they're, uh, they prefer. And then there are the male bees, the drones in the colony. Again, they're larger than the workers, have these great big eyes um, that they use to find queens to mate with. And depending on the time of year, there may be no drones. Like right now here in Ohio, all the drones have been uh, kicked out for the winter. Uh, but during the, uh, the, you know, the spring and summer, there could be hundreds or even thousands of drones in a particular colony to mate with uh, new, new queens that are made over the course of the season. So lots of, lots of bees in a, in a honeybee colony and lots of interactions going on in there. So bees and all bees are, are what we entomologists call holometabolous insects in that they go through complete metamorphosis uh, as they develop. So that queen, she lays an egg in the bottom of one of these wax cells that the bees build for themselves. And then over the course of three days, that egg will uh, hatch into a young larva. Uh, honeybee larvae are, are really incapable of taking care of themselves at all. They, they really totally depend on the adult bees to feed them. And they, they don't really feed on pollen and nectar. Uh, they feed on the glandular secretions of the adult nurse bees. Those, those uh, adult nurse bees feed on the pollen and nectar, and then they secrete jelly um, that they feed to these young larvae. So it's actually very similar to mammals in that you know, we create milk to feed to our young. Honeybees create this jelly, royal jelly or worker jelly that they feed to, to their young larvae uh, to, so that they will grow very rapidly, uh, fill that cell over the course of five days. And then this, uh, the cell will get capped over with wax and that, that, uh, that young larva, or now an older larva, will stretch out in the cell and undergo pupation and will, uh, over the course of 12 days, take on the form of an adult bee. And then 21 days after that egg was laid, an adult bee will chew her way out of the cell and uh, join the, the force of worker bees that's in that colony. Uh, this happens, you know, 21 days like clockwork. And that's one of the reasons it's so predictable is because the honeybees work very hard to maintain the colony at 34 degrees Celsius. And that maintains a very predictable uh, developmental timeline for these uh, young bees. Of course, once an adult emerges, she's not actually done developing. Um, as bees, as adult bees age, they continue to develop and they, they take on different roles within the colony as they age. So the younger bees in a colony generally stay within the nest. They don't leave because their flight muscles are not yet developed. Um, and there's lots of work to do inside the colony anyway. So they, you know, welcome to adulthood, young bee. Your first job is to clean up the cells that you, you just crawled out of. No more laying around getting fed by the, uh, the adult nurse bees. Um, time to start working. Um, as they age, they will start to be able to secrete wax. You see wax scales coming off of this, this young worker here. She consumes really large amounts of nectar in order to convert the, the, the sugars in that nectar into the wax that they use to construct the combs within the nest. Um, they'll take on other tasks such as that nursing activity. They'll consume that, that pollen and nectar in order pr to produce the, the brood food that they feed to their younger sisters, the larvae. As they age, they will start to you know, handle uh, food, groom the queen, um, groom other bees, and then as they, as they age further, they start to migrate towards the entrance of the nest and will begin to ventilate or guard the colony. Obviously these require some wing, develop, wing muscle development so that they can fan or can fly outside the colony or in order to, uh, to sting any potential intruders, whether that's other bees or uh, beekeepers. I certainly have experienced that uh, guarding behavior many times myself. And then finally, the last job that any bee does in a colony is foraging. So it's, it's really only the oldest bees in the colony that are out there visiting the, the flowers to collect the pollen and nectar. 
And this is a really elegant system that the honeybees have. They have the oldest bees do the most dangerous task in the colony. So these old foraging bees, um, they've, they've already done all these indoor tasks and all that's left for them to do is forage uh, because foraging is a really demanding task of honeybees. Um, a forager on average lives about seven days after it begins foraging. Um, and it's, it's always amazing to me to think that if you see a, a bee on a flower, that, that bee has, has less than a week left to live um, because it's just going to wear itself out. It's gonna wear its wings out. It's gonna wear its flight muscles out uh, doing this foraging that, that the colony needs to, to get the, the food that it needs to survive. So honeybees, um, as well as all the other bees out there have a, a host of problems uh, that is, is threatening their, their survival and their health in today's environment. And so here I put this Venn diagram up here to just to represent all the different problems facing honeybees. Some of these are, are only specific to honeybees, but many of them are relevant to other bee species as well, such as viruses could certainly move between uh, different insect species. Um, pesticides affect honeybees and other bees similarly. Um, but some of these are really specific to, to honeybees, such as the varroa mite, which is really a devastating parasite of honeybees and responsible for a lot of the losses that beekeepers have been experiencing. But the one I'm gonna talk about today is this nutrition question. Because of course, honeybees need flowers and to provide the pollen and nectar that they need to survive, just like any other bee. So they're willing to travel a, a huge distance in order to get the food that they need in order to survive. Um, the average foraging distance is estimated at two miles. I mean, it, it could be actually up to 10 miles that, that honeybees have been known to forage to, to collect what they need in the environment. But two miles is certainly not out of the question and, and is, is, is a common foraging range. I mean, that's, that's a huge area that these um, foraging bees need to cover in order to find the food that they need. Now, of course, honeybees are as, as lazy as anyone else. And if they can find all of the forage that they need to survive within a, a much smaller radius, they'll do that. There's no reason they want to fly to two miles. That's just the distance they need to fly to find the food that they need. And they're out there collecting just four things. Um, honeybees will collect nectar, which provides is of course the, the, what they will eventually ripen into honey if they don't consume it. And honey is the kind of the long-term storage of nectar um, once they remove some of the water so that it becomes I guess, shelf stable for lack of a a better term and is, is in long-term storage. Um, the nectar provides the carbohydrates for the colony uh, to, to power uh, their activities, as well as uh, they'll convert the sugars in here into wax that they use to construct the, uh, the colony itself. Uh, they consume pollen, which they collect from flowers as well. And here we've got some bee bread that those bees have collected and packed into these cells uh, for you know, short to medium term storage. This provides the, uh, the, the protein and the fat that the, uh, the, the bees need to survive. Um, bees are also out there collecting water. Uh, they need this to dilute honey and to cool the colony in the summertime. And they collect propolis. And actually a number of bee species will collect propolis. Uh, this is a substance they get from the buds of trees. And they use this as kind of a caulking material to fill any cracks within the, uh, within the hive or as kind of a shellac that they use to coat the interior of the, of the nest, uh, provides a nice antimicrobial uh, layer to prevent any sort of uh, bacterial fungal growth uh, within the, the, the nest environment. But what's astonishing, I mean, a honeybee has, you know, tens of thousands of individuals in it. So they, they need a large amount of food in order to survive a year. So these are the, the estimates about how much nectar and pollen it takes to sustain a, a honeybee hive over the course of a year. It takes about 650 pounds of nectar, 44 pounds of pollen in order to, to keep that, that one honeybee colony alive over the course of a year. Um, and this is the reason that they're foraging out over that large area because it's, they need to take advantage of all of the nectar and pollen resources available uh, within their flight range in order to collect the, the food that they need in order to, to survive a year. Now, most of this actually comes uh, generally from a few different, uh, a relatively few plant species. Uh, honeybees are really well adapted at taking advantage of mass flowering resources. Uh, think of like a, an alfalfa field in bloom is paradise for bees because they can very quickly 
recruit a large number of foragers to really take maximum advantage to something that's in abundance in the, in the landscape. And honeybees are really well adapted to take, take advantage of that. And so much of the 650 pounds of nectar that they collect, a lot of that actually is collected over just a few weeks in the year when there's something really good that's blooming. And much of the rest of the year, they're just, uh, just treading water or consuming some of what they've collected. So honeybees are, are able to really take advantage of these mass flowering resources much more so than other bee species. So because uh, I'm in Ohio, Denise is in Ohio, I'm gonna, the rest of this is actually gonna be very Ohio specific. So hopefully you, those of you that are elsewhere in the country or in the world can, uh, can, can take some, something away from this, but I'm, I'm really focused on the, the specifics of beekeeping in here in Ohio, because of course all beekeeping is local. Um, the local conditions really dictate uh, how successful bees are or are not. So I do research here in Ohio, and hopefully there's some messages that you can take home with you. Um, currently, there are almost 10,000 registered honeybee apiaries within the state of Ohio, managed by about 6,000 beekeepers. Uh, and together, those bees produced a, about 850,000 pounds of honey. That's about 50 pounds of honey per colony. Now, it's inter interesting to see uh, where those colonies are located. Uh, many, there are more apiaries, more beekeepers, uh, keeping bees in the urban areas, obviously because there's more people to be beekeepers in urban areas. Uh, up here in Cleveland, down the Akron area, Columbus, down to Dayton and Cincinnati, there's a high number of apiaries. But many of the colonies in Ohio are in these urban areas, but a lot of colonies are out here in uh, Northwest Ohio, uh, where there's really a large amount of agricultural land. A lot of corn and soybeans are grown out here in the northwestern part of the state. Um, and, and the beekeepers are quite successful out in that, that agricultural area. So when I first started here at OSU back in 2011, uh, Doug Sponsler was my first graduate student. He actually started here at OSU the same day I did. Um, and Doug is from uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and he was very interested in urban beekeeping at the time, and he still is. Uh, he went on to publish uh, several papers on beekeeping in Philadelphia more recently. Um, but when he started, he was, he, was, he was really interested in the question, are agricultural areas really better areas to keep bees or are urban areas better? And he was interested in this, not just for being from, uh, from Philadelphia, from a highly urban area, but at, back in 2011, 2012, urban beekeeping was really... Uh, in everyone's mind, and there were all sorts of articles being published about how urban beekeeping uh, is, is such a great thing. Um, and there were all these uh, news reports about, you know, city bees being healthier and more productive than bees in more rural or agricultural environments where we traditionally think of bees being kept. And so Doug, uh, at the time, he was, uh, you know, there's lots of news reports, but he was interested, what's the research behind these news reports? So he, he dug into the, the background behind these reports, and he, he found that there was actually no research on this topic, um, very little research back at, the time, at this time uh, that demonstrating that the urban bees actually were more successful. And so he saw this as a really excellent um, research opportunity, and he set out to, to do some really simple experiments to show whether urban or agricultural, agricultural bees were really uh, more successful and more productive. So the way Doug did this is we enlisted uh, the beekeepers across the state of Ohio to help us with this experiment. And we did this uh, through the Ohio State Beekeepers Association and through uh, finding volunteer beekeepers that were willing to track the success of colonies in different environments over the course of the beekeeping season. This is from, from May until September, which is when the, the bees do most of their foraging and nectar collecting here in the, the temperate zone. So he found all these vol uh, volunteer beekeepers and he gave them surveys that they needed to fill out. Um, the first survey was right around May when they were installing new packages of bees. So if a beekeeper um, wants to start a new colony, one of the ways they can do that is by purchasing a package of bees in a wooden box like this. Um, and this contains about 10,000 bees, that's about three pounds of bees, and a mated queen. And it's just a matter of shaking these bees into your, your hive equipment, and they, they will quickly take up residence there and 
ta-da, there you are. You're, you're now a beekeeper and you've, you've captured this artificial swarm and given them a nest to live in. And they will then forage on the flowers in the landscape around that apiary and will, will grow and hopefully succeed over the course of that summer, storing enough uh, honey in order to survive the upcoming winter. And then of, of course, Doug followed up on that survey with another survey in September where he asked the beekeepers to score the, the size of their colonies, how many frames of, of bees, how many frames of honey, how many frames of pollen are in that colony over the course uh, that they, they collected over the course of that summer. This is a really nice experiment, I think, because all beekeepers start out with essentially the same box of bees. The only, only determinant in how many frames of honey they're gonna produce is really the environment that that, that box of bees is placed in. So we got a really good response from the beekeepers across the state. Each of these stars represents a beekeeper that filled out both of the surveys and we have a good representation. The, the red areas on this map are urban land. Uh, the green areas on this map are forest and the brown areas are agricultural land. And you can see he was especially interested in this question of urban beekeeping. So we got a lot of beekeepers in highly urban areas. And if we, he did some landscape analysis around each of these apiaries and he broke it down, this is at a two kilometer radius from the site of that, uh, those hive where they were located in the environment. And he categorized that land cover around each apiary uh, based on how much urban land, how much agricultural land and how much forested land was around them. So, and he, he organized them here by uh, the amount of urban land. So on the right here, this is a highly urban site with almost 100% urban land around this particular apiary. And on the left here, we've got a very agricultural site, very little urban land, and we have most of this yellow uh, agricultural land surrounding uh, this particular apiary. So a good distribution of uh, agricultural or rural uh, to urban. So the first, Doug did a lot of analysis on this. Um, and the take home message from this study was that here we have food accumulation in frames of, of honey or, or pollen on the y-axis in this chart. And then on the uh, x-axis, we have the landscape composition going from cropland on the left to more forested land on the right. And what he found is that areas with more cropland around them and less forest around them produced more frames of honey than those in more forest-rich environments. So in this case, here in Ohio, cropland is superior to forested land for honey production. But you can see this, this line is fit through the data, but there's a lot of variation. Each of these dots represents one of these uh, colonies that was followed. Um, so there's a lot of variability from site to site, but overall the trend was that agricultural land was, was better for honey production than forested land. And then he wanted to test his hypothesis that urban land would be better for beekeeping than uh, agricultural land, which was the what all these news reports in the media were saying. And he actually found the opposite. Doug found that, that it, it again, we have food accumulation in frames of honey on the, on the y-axis here, and then we have cropland versus urban land on the x-axis. And again, we find that cropland, uh, bees located in cropland produce more honey than bees located in more urban environments, which I guess demonstrated that that the uh, the news reports were not at least not correct at least for us here in Ohio uh, that that actually agricultural land was was better for bees than urban land or forested land. Now it's it's always humbling uh, in research to find out that something you just discovered was discovered like 30 years ago, and so Doug was looking through the uh, gleanings in bee culture archives, and we have a, a nice catalog of old beekeeping journals here. Uh, at the Bee Lab in Worcester. And he, he found this uh, article from the 1970s uh, showing that people have known this for a long time, that uh, you know these agricultural lands in uh, Northwest Ohio are of primary production, honey production value. Um, these, you know, the, the areas containing most of the urban areas in Ohio along this, uh, this area here were of secondary honey production value. And the forested land in Southeastern Ohio was really of marginal honey production value. So I guess it was nice to see that that, that pattern identified in the 1970s holds up today and that 
the agricultural land, while probably not as good as it was back in the 1970s for a variety of reasons, is still better uh, than, than the, the more marginal forested land uh, in, in southeastern Ohio. So this was really a, a, a tantalizing and really fascinating experiment that Doug did. And he, he wanted to dig in further to identify exactly what it was about agricultural land that made bees do so well there. And, and conversely, what it was about urban land that, that was inhibiting their success. Why weren't they doing better in urban lands, despite the you know, reports from, from beekeepers elsewhere uh, that the bees were doing well there? So he set up uh, four apiaries around Columbus. So this red blob right here is the city of Columbus. And then out to the west of Columbus, you quickly get into highly agricultural corn and soybean agriculture. Um, and he set up these four uh, apiary sites. One of them was right on the OSU campus, um, very urban site. We actually on top of a parking garage across from the hospital, the, uh, the uh, OSU hospital, if any of you have been down there. He set up another apiary in kind of more of a suburban site up here in Clintonville, which is uh, single family houses, but, but relatively close together, not, a, uh, not super dense, but fairly dense area. And then this interesting site was right on the western edge of Columbus. Um, and he, this site um, gave the bees a choice. They could fly to the east to get into the urban areas, or they could fly to the west to the more agricultural areas. And then site D out here was a pure agricultural site, um, which is surrounded really by corn and soybean agriculture. This is at uh, Farm Science Review along Interstate 70 here, if any of you are familiar with that area. Um, it's, it's on some uh, OSU property, Farm Science Review. And so first I'm gonna show you some results from this particular site, site C, where the bees actually have a choice between urban land and agricultural land. And, and we wanted to see what they were foraging on specifically at that site. And this site um, is actually on a cemetery. This is a, a Civil War era cemetery um, from the people, I don't think anyone's been buried here in the last hundred years. We, we kind of got permission to place some bees at this site. Um, you can see the colonies in the background there. Um, I think they were actually happy to have some, uh, they'd had some vandalism issues at this cemetery. They were happy to have, have the bees there, have some activity maybe hoping that the, the bees would uh, discourage the vandals from, from approaching. I don't know if that worked, but it was, it was a very, very kind of them to allow us to, to keep the bees there uh, to answer our question. So we have traditional you know, uh, Langstroth style bee boxes back here, but we also uh, put up this tent and inside this tent, we had um, wooden observation hives. So these are uh, glass walled hives where you can actually see the bee activity Inside, uh, inside the hive. We wanted to see the bee activity because we wanted to record it with a video camera. So here's a video camera recording the activity in this, uh, this beehive. And the reason we wanted to record the bees activity is because we wanted to look at the bees waggle dance. So you, you may be familiar with the bees waggle dance. This is another reason that the honeybees are just amazing animals is they have this method to communicate to each other um, the location of highly profitable nectar or pollen sources within that, that two mile foraging range. So the way they do this is a bee will dance, they will waggle their abdomen, and then will we'll turn around and waggle it again in this kind of figure eight shape. And they're communicating to the observer bees here the, uh, the direction relative to the sun that the, a bee needs to fly in order to find this particular patch of flowers. And they're communicating the distance that these bees need to fly in order to find this patch of flowers. So they've, they've got both the direction and the distance encoded in this figure eight waggle dance uh, that this, this particular bee is communicating to her sisters. And this is really, I think, the secret sauce for why honeybees are exceptionally good at exploiting these, you know, these nectar explosions that happen with particular plant species uh, in mass flowering crops in a landscape or mass flowering uh, events in a landscape because they're very, they're able to very quickly recruit lots of bees to exploit this resource in the landscape because it, it may only be there for a few hours or a few days, but they can quickly get a, a large workforce out there to take advantage of those, those flowers when they're available in the landscape. 
So we recorded all of these B dances and then um, interpreted the dances with a, the help of a computer and, and a large number of undergraduates to help uh, decode these dances and the angle and the duration of each of these dances. And then taking these dances, we can plot the bees foraging preferences onto a map. So we can actually eavesdrop on the bees as they're talking to each other about what are the best flowers in this particular landscape. Where are they encouraging other bees to go in order to find the, the pollen and nectar that they are, are collecting? And so first off, Doug categorized this landscape to make it a little easier to interpret. Uh, we've got agricultural land in the light green here. Uh, we've got suburban land or residential land in the pink. And then this is commercial property in the light blue. And this green spot right here is a golf course. And then we can just overlay the bees uh, dancing onto this landscape. Uh, I, sh I should mention these are dances that were interpreted in, in August and September um, of that year. And he, he made weekly recordings of the bees dances from three of those observation hives to make this map. And you can get a pretty good sense of the results just by looking at this, uh, this cloud of dance, uh, dance mappings that they really tend to prefer to go out here to the, to the west and the southwest into the agricultural land. They don't much care for this particular golf course, though they seem to be flying over it to get something uh, north of it. And there's a little bit of foraging into this residential area, um, but not, certainly not, not as much as they're foraging to the southwest to that agricultural land. And so we, we did some statistics on this, and we found that actually 78% of the bees foraging, when given a choice, was to this rural environment. And that was a significant difference, that they were, they were, they were preferring to forage in the rural environment versus the urban environment uh, during this period. So then the question is, well, they're, they're going to the rural environment. What is it that they're foraging on when they're out there? Well, we can answer that question as well. And I'm going to now show you results from all four of these sites. We, we only did the waggle dance analysis at this site C because it was provided such a really interesting opportunity for that, uh, that waggle dance analysis and a very clear cut choice for the bees to, to forge in urban or agricultural land. Um, but we, at all of these sites, we, another way to determine where the bees are foraging is by looking at the pollen that they're bringing back uh, when they return from those foraging flights. So we, we actually used a pollen trap, um, and this is a device common among beekeepers for harvesting pollen for consumption or sale. Uh, we, we use this to collect the pollen off of the, uh, the legs of the bees, and you can see that those pollen balls fall into this, this screen basket um, that we can then collect from every few days uh, to, to get a, a cross-section of the pollen the, the flowers from the, and the pollen that produced by those flowers that the bees are visiting. And that pollen, um, here are some pollen balls from these different environments, has different characteristic colors. Um, so in the highly agricultural site here, you can see that during uh, the month of August, we were getting really 100% brown pollen. And then in September, it was really 100% orange pollen. Um, while at this, uh, this highly urban site, this is on top of that parking garage on the OSU campus, you can see it was a much more diverse pollen mix, lots of different colors of pollen. Uh, you still see a little bit of that brown and a little bit of that orange, but it's a much more diverse pollen that the, the bees are foraging on in the, in the highly urban environment. So the color actually can be a really good indicator, and there are color guides out there that you can use to identify pollen just based on the color. Um, but we there are other methods that we use to actually identify the plants that this pollen came from uh, to, to really answer this question. One of the ways that we have used in the past is uh, using light microscopy. So you can take these pollen balls, uh, dissolve them in water, and then put those pollen grains onto a microscope slide with some uh, fusion jelly to stain them red and look at them under uh, a light microscope at 400X. And you can see, I mean, that pollen actually has all sorts of crazy shapes, actually, that you can use to identify the plant that the pollen came from. Here's some dandelion pollen with that spiky uh, pollen coat. Here's some aster pollen, daisy pollen. Um, these are all uh, pollens from the Asteraceae, uh, which are all characteristically spiky. 
Um, but the, the legumes have a very characteristic shape as well. And with some practice, um, actually quite a bit of practice, you can get pretty good at identifying the plant um, that is associated with each of these different pollen morphologies and can use that to determine what bees were foraging on just using light microscopy. Now, the problem with this method is it really takes quite a bit of expertise to be able to determine which flower, which plant the pollen came from with a high degree of confidence. Um, and it can, take, it can take years or decades even to develop that kind of expertise. And there's not a lot of people that, that are able to do this with uh, high confidence. And so we were interested in, in using a method that would be, didn't require this level of expertise. Um, and we found that, that uh, using DNA sequencing was a really useful alternative here. This is a, a method that was really pioneered in the lab by Rodney Richardson, a, a, a PhD student who's since graduated. He's now a faculty member at the uh, University of Maryland. Um, but he, he, he developed this method where we break open those pollen grains to release the DNA through really violent uh, shaking in this bead beater here with some glass beads. Those, those pollen grains are actually very tough and it takes a lot of force in order to release the DNA that's contained within those grains. Because of course, pollen is meant to be a transport device for DNA as it's transported for pollination. Um, so it's meant to protect the DNA that's within it. But you can get it out with enough, uh, enough force. And then we used a, a PCR polymerase chain reaction to amplify specific sequences within the plant DNA. Here's a picture of our PCR machine that's amplifying those, those specific sequences. Uh, and then we can run that. Uh, those amplified sequences on a gel. And you can see that we, we were successful in amplifying uh, these metabarcoding regions. And then we can submit those libraries for uh, high throughput DNA sequencing, where they, you can actually sequence millions of DNA sequences all at the same time, get back these huge data files, which you can then use to identify the plants uh, using some uh, computational techniques and bioinformatics to identify the actual plant uh, plants that were present in that pollen um, and, and essentially do the same thing that we were doing with light microscopy, but this is with a technique that, that uses a computer rather than human expertise. And so here are the results from that study from the four different sites around Columbus. And these are the plant genera that were present in those pollen samples that we collected on a, a weekly basis over the course of that, uh, that summer in 2014. And these are arranged with the less urban sites on the left here and the more urban sites on the right. So this is that one on the uh, parking garage. This is the one out at Farm Science Review surrounded by corn and soybeans. And these are the intermediate sites. And you can quickly see that there are uh, changes over the course of the season, but there are some real rock stars here that bees are foraging on regardless of the urban or agricultural nature of the landscape. The first one that really jumps out at me is this one, the trifolium. This is the clovers. Um, here we got some uh, white Dutch clover, some red clover. Clovers are bees' favorite food, and honeybees, at least, will find clover pretty much in any environment that you put them in, uh, because clover is really present everywhere. And, and it's true, honeybees absolutely love clover, and it doesn't matter whether it's urban, agricultural, they're going to find clover and bring that pollen and nectar back to the uh, back to feed the colony. Um, another one here is melilotus. This is sweet clover. Again, another excellent uh, bee food. This is more present earlier in the season. Uh, interesting. It was both in in again in agricultural and urban areas. The bees were finding this sweet clover, one of their favorite foods. Another one that was really uniform across all uh, urban and agricultural sites was plantain or plantago. Um, and this is this little kind of ugly plant that grows in your, your lawn. Um, I've got a lot of it in my lawn and I never really considered it to be a, a good pollinator plant until we found these results. And it turns out that the plantain is actually a, a favored food source, at least a favored pollen source for bees. And it very consistently shows up in the pollen samples that we've been collecting. Underappreciated uh, pollinator plant, uh, there's no doubt about that. Another one here, maybe not so unexpected, was goldenrod or solidago, which shows up later in the series here in September when those, uh, those goldenrods are blooming out along the roadsides. 
This tends to be more abundant in agricultural sites because this is kind of a, the sort of plant that grows along roadsides quite abundantly, much less abundant in urban areas, uh, not really an ornamental plant that many people are, are uh, putting into their landscapes, uh, kind of tall and I guess kind of unsightly for many people, but again, a really great food source for bees uh, during the late season. Um, some, some plants were really only present in the agricultural environment, such as partridge pea or chemicrista. Um, this is uh, planted largely for erosion control in many of these sites. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's a legume, so it produces good nectar, and the bees seem to really uh, seek it out when it's available. Uh, there's not a lot of this planted in more urban sites, so it's really didn't show up in the pollen samples there uh, much at all. In the more urban sites, uh, we did find a, a few things that were in urban sites, but not in agricultural sites. One of those is hedera or English ivy. Um, I never thought of this as a, a bee food before, but it consistently shows up in urban areas. Um, it must have uh, flowers underneath those leaves that the bees are attracted to. Um, though I, I don't find them particularly attractive myself, but the bees are, are finding them and collecting pollen from your, your, the ivy that, that might be in your, uh, under your trees in your yard. And hydrangeas, uh, not a lot of hydrangeas out in agricultural landscapes, except maybe in some, some uh, yards that are out there. But again, uh, this is a highly abundant plant in more urban landscapes. And finally, elm. Um, this appeared at our most urban site uh, this is probably not the American elm, but this is, uh, you know, these ornamental Chinese elms that have been planted. Um, again, I never thought of it as a bee plant, but the bees are foraging a, a fairly large amount of pollen from this uh, at our most urban site. So a lot of different things these bees were foraging on. Um, there's a link to this paper that in the, uh, on the, on the web page associated with this, uh, this series, and I, take, I encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested. Um, the take home message is that bees, they have, they have there's some greatest hits out there, the trifolium, the clovers, bees were in whatever environment they're in, bees love clover. Um, but the, the diversity of pollen collected tended to be greater in more urban areas. And the bees were switching from plant to plant more rapidly in more urban areas. Um, and while that may sound like a good thing for bees, you know, there's more floral diversity, more pollen turnover in urban areas. Um, this is maybe not necessarily a good thing for honeybees because as Doug showed, bees are doing better in more agricultural environments. And given the choice, they will forage in those more agricultural environments. So while the, the greater floral diversity uh, might be good for other bee species, uh, honeybees are really adapted to take advantage of these mass flowering resources that are more abundant in a more agricultural landscape, at least here in Ohio. Um, so this, this diversity and turnover may not actually be a benefit for honeybees kept in urban areas because these represent a lot of switching between different plants and bees are special, honeybees are specialists at foraging on, uh, really abundant resources in an, in an environment. Which leads us to a, really a follow-up experiment that's, uh, being performed by Harper McMinn-Souder, a current PhD student in the lab, and she wanted to get more information about how, do, how does urban and agricultural environments affect honey collection? So Doug did his work in pollen, uh, but the, that really left the question open. That's really half the equation. How about nectar collection and honey production in these different environments? And how does that relate to the urban or agricultural land cover in a particular site? That's what Harper set out to, uh, to, to look at with her PhD research. And for this, again, we're looking around the Columbus area we have a dozen sites uh, spread around Columbus, broken up into high agricultural sites, which are indicated in red, medium agricultural sites in yellow, and more urban sites in blue. And again, we've got these, uh, these agricultural sites are out west of Columbus, predominantly in the corn and soybean agro ecosystem that is so prevalent in, uh, in a large part of, of Ohio once you get to outside of the cities. And we set up our apiaries out here uh, again, um, with pollen traps on them. And except in this case, because we're so interested in honey, we're adding a new tool to the toolbox and that is these hive scales. And these are, are scales that uh, have an electronic recorder in them that records the weight of that colony every five minutes 
um, throughout the entire year. So you can easily go out and download these weight data from these broodminder hive scales uh, to your phone. And then we can then analyze those data to determine when are these, these colonies gaining weight? When are they losing weight? Um, which would indicate either a, a nectar flow or a nectar dearth. And then try to relate that to the, the, uh, the honey that the bees are collecting during that period of time. Again, using pollen analysis to identify where that, that honey came from. Um, so I think these are really interesting tools to use both for research and for beekeepers because much of the weight change in a colony is actually due to the, the, the honey that's being collected because honey is extremely heavy. I've lifted a, a lot of honey boxes myself and it's the honey that constitutes much of the weight of a colony. So if a colony is gaining weight, that's because they are collecting honey during that period. And if they're losing weight, that's because either the beekeeper has harvested honey or the, the bees are actually dipping into that reserve of honey that they have stored from previous uh, good times. So the way this data looks, um, after you download the data, you can uh, we upload it to the, the Broodminder website and it produces these nice uh, graphs where you can actually look at the weight change from day to day over the course of the season. Um, and any beekeeper who puts one of these hives on their, their colony can take a look at this data and just kind of get a sense for when colonies are gaining or losing weight. But because we're doing this for research, we wanted to get uh, a more quantitative way to analyze these data. So Harper uh, dug into this. And so here's the raw weight data, but we're not interested so much in the raw weight because you know, the colonies, beekeepers are manipulating the, the colonies and there's other changes. You know, Big colonies produce more honey than small colonies. We wanna really get rid of all that variability related to colony size and beekeeper manipulation. And so she did a whole series of uh, manipulations of this data to get rid of, you know, honey harvests, to uh, clean out the artifacts, and to standardize these curves, uh, getting rid of any differences in the colony size, and then finally producing this reconstructed weight, which more clearly shows when the colonies were gaining weight and when they were losing weight, so that we can relate that to the landscape and to the the, uh, the floral origin of the honey that those bees are collecting. So here's the results from uh, those sites collected in, in 2019 in the midsummer. This is from the 1st of July through the 1st of September. And this is organized by agricultural intensity. That's really what Harper is interested in. Um, we got our most agricultural site up here at the top left. Um, and as you move down, we get down here to uh, the Roth and Bueller Honeybee Lab, which is on the OSU campus, which is essentially 0% agriculture. And the trend here is that they, these colonies in highly agricultural sites are gaining weight throughout the months of July and into August, while the colonies in less agricultural sites are holding steady or losing weight during the same period. Our most uh, urban site at the Roth and Bueller Bee Lab was actually losing weight over the month of July over the months of July and August, whereas our most agricultural sites were gaining weight during that same period, which is a good, which is really uh, confirms Doug's uh, observation that bees are gaining more weight, or beekeepers are collecting more honey in more agricultural than urban environments. But the question is, what are they foraging on? Where is this weight coming from? What are the flowers that are contributing the nectar to this weight gain? So to do this, to, to answer that question, we again turn to metabarcoding of pollen, you know, taking the DNA out of the pollen, uh, using PCR to amplify it, and then se sequencing that DNA. But this time, instead of pollen, we're going to use nectar that was collected out of those colonies. And to do this, we take honey that we collect from the, the, the colonies, uh, dilute that in 70% ethanol to loosen it up, and then we centrifuge that honey and ethanol mixture, and that, that will cause any residual pollen that's in that honey uh, to form a pellet in the bottom of this tube. And then we can take that, uh, that pollen pellet out of there and you can put it onto a basic fusion jelly slide for light microscope analysis. Or in our case, we're gonna take that and do uh, DNA metabarcoding to identify the pollen, the, the floral source of the, of the pollen and the nectar uh, that went to make the honey that the bees are collecting to gain this weight. Again, we did used our bead beater to break open those, those uh, pollen um, coat to get the DNA and to do this PCR analysis. 
and, and, and uh, DNA sequencing. And so here are, are Harper's results from the month of July in the more urban sites. And again, we see trifolium is a major component of bees foraging in the month of July. Just as we saw trifolium, of course, is the clovers. Bees still love clover. Um, every study we do in here always shows that, that bees love clover a lot. Um, there's some other species in here. Again, we're seeing a little bit of goldenrod, possibly from the previous season. Here's that plantago, the plantain again, uh, still present here, as well as a number of other species of plant. Uh, again, good amount of diversity in the nectar that bees are collecting in urban sites uh, during the summer. Less diversity in the more agricultural sites. Again, we see a lot of trifolium here, that's the clovers. But here, a different species is popping up, and this is glycine. Uh, glycine is actually um, soybean. Um, and this could be one of the explanations for why honeybees are doing so well in agricultural environments, at least here in Ohio, is because they're foraging on the really abundant soybean that is planted each year in this state. Uh, Ohio is home to 4.8 million acres of soybean each summer. That's about 17% of the land area of the state. So no shortage of soybean for these bees to forage on if they're in an agricultural environment. Soybean is, is largely unappreciated, like many of these flowers are, because it's not showy at all. I mean, this is a soybean field in prime bloom. You got to get your head underneath that soybean canopy to see these little tiny flowers um, that the bees are visiting. If you do get down there, you will see bees, but it's not the sort of thing you're just going to notice uh, without you know, putting some effort into, into looking for the bees that are out there. So I think this is really good evidence that, that the honeybees are able to take advantage of this mass flowering resource. And there's no more mass flowering resource in the state of Ohio than there is soybean bloom um, to support that honey production that bees are, are doing in more, more agricultural areas during the summer. And this could largely explain uh, the, what Doug saw in his original study back in 2012 and 2013, that bees in more agricultural sites collect and store more honey, possibly because they're taking advantage of soybean uh, to make all of that honey. And, and what Harper found is that the bees that are in urban sites do collect soybean honey as well, um, they are probably flying some distance in order to get that soybean, but they're, they're taking advantage of the mass flowering blooms in their environment. And that's really what makes honeybees succeed in any environment is, is access to these huge areas of mass flowering crops or other sorts of flowers. So in conclusion, um, forage is generally better for honeybees in agricultural areas than in forested or urban areas, at least here in Ohio. And if you're interested in keeping bees for honey production, um, you probably want to keep your bees in one of these agricultural landscapes. That's the best we've got going here in Ohio. How this relates to beekeeping in, in other areas is, is hard to say. I know other studies have found that, that urban beekeeping can be extremely successful uh, in Europe and in other areas within the US, but at least here in Ohio, or at least in the Columbus area, uh, urban sites are just not as good for, for honey production as elsewhere. Um, there's lots, of course, lots of other reasons that people might keep honeybees as, as really fascinating pets if you're into keeping, keeping honeybees. Um, that's certainly appropriate to do in an urban area, uh, I believe. But if it's maximum honey production you're after, um, you want to find an agricultural site, at least here in Ohio. Um, and honeybees are really adapted through their use of the waggle dance and their large colonies to take advantage of these mass flowering resources like soybean, like clover, like goldenrod, these huge bonanzas of nectar and pollen that appear in the landscape for relatively short periods of time, honeybees can really, really exploit those kinds of resources and make very large amounts of honey over a short period of time to sustain themselves over the, the course of the year. And finally, there's, you know, bees love clover, um, but there's a lot of things that we really didn't expect to see in both the pollen and the honey analysis that we've done. You know, soybeans, partridge pea, plantain, elm. I mean, these are a lot of things that I never would have uh, put at the top of my list for likely sources for pollen and nectar uh, for honeybees. But 
Um, I think I think a lot more research needs to be done, not into just what honeybees are foraging on, but what in you know which plants in the landscape are really supporting the diversity of bees that are out there. Because I suspect it's a lot of things that we we really aren't thinking of that are really maybe most beneficial for for the bees in in both urban and and agricultural landscapes. And I think we need to think a lot more about uh, how we really best manage the the land around us to support support bees, uh, whether that's honeybees or wild bees, and whether that's a, a more rural landscape or a more urban landscape, I think we need to do more research in this area so that we can, can best support the bees around us. So I'd like to thank everyone in the lab that contributed to this, this research. Um, uh, the uh, bioinformatics was all done at the Ohio Supercomputer Center and for uh, the USDA uh, National Institute of Food Agricult and Agriculture for supporting the, uh, this through funding. And I'm happy to answer questions now uh, through the, uh, that you have submitted, or if you have other questions, you're welcome to send me an email. I'm happy to answer questions there too. Wonderful, thanks, Reed. I, I think it's just fascinating how you have put a window into that superorganism of the honeybee colony. Uh, many windows, what are they uh, bringing you back for nectar sources, pollen sources? Uh, what are the dances telling you and the adding in the DNA barcoding, really fascinating. Um, so we do have some um, some great questions, folks. If you have to jump off on the hour, um, I know that Reed would appreciate a, um, a thank you in the chat box if you'd like to do that, but we'll keep recording the questions so you can come back to the those uh, when the recording's available. Uh, Reed, there was just a clarification question about when you show the maps for Col of Columbus, for example, and you show that foraging circle, uh, what kind of radius were you uh, looking at there? So for the dance analysis, we, we did as far as they were going. I mean, we, we just interpreted the, the distance. I believe that was about three kilometers uh, distant from Columbus, uh, from the, the, the apiary site on the, in the cemetery there in Columbus. Um, okay, I love the uh, the vandal um, uh, idea uh, about honeybees uh, maybe keeping them out of the cemetery. Um, there are, as is familiar to you, Reed, uh, a few questions and comments about honeybees versus wild bees, and is there competition there? And I wondered if you wanted to um, give your perspective on that a bit. So, the, I mean, the competition question is is one that um, certainly comes up, and I I know there's a lot of ongoing research into trying to get into that question. I think honeybees, honeybees are really well adapted to these large foraging opportunities that these mass flowering crops present. And I don't think there's any other bee out there that can really compete with honeybees on that, on that front. You, you gotta remember, you know, soybeans are blooming. That is essentially an infinite resource from the point of view of a pollinator, because there's no way the bees are gonna, Honeybees, doesn't matter how many honeybees are in that area at that particular time, they're not going to consume all of the nectar that those soybeans are producing. It's just so abundant. And so I, I think honeybees, I, I think, are, are highly appropriate in agricultural landscape because they are most productive there. I think there's less competition there because they're, the honeybees are making most of their uh, nectar and pollen stores during these periods of, of mass bloom when these resources are essentially infinite uh, from the point of view of the bee. Now in, in other environments where it might be more sensitive, I, I don't know, I think agri uh, more urban environments, um, honeybees have to work harder to find the food that they're looking for. That's why they're, they're foraging on different plants. Um, and it's, it's harder to say whether in an urban environment there is competition or not. And I think that's an interesting area that really requires more research. Um, but I think, I think there's no question that honeybees are definitely appropriate in agricultural landscapes, and there's probably less competition there just because the bees are able to take care, take advantage of, of the resources that are available in an, in an agricultural landscape with such, um, so well in that, in that environment. Uh, Reese offers a question about the phenology calendar. I'm kind of rephrase the question a bit, um, and maybe you could talk about our OSU phenology calendar just briefly and whether you use that sequence of bloom. There are a lot of folks from outside of Ohio, so they may not be familiar with that calendar. And Marsha, maybe you can snag it or someone can snag a link and put that in the chat box to our OSU phenology calendar. So when we were doing light microscopy, we absolutely used the, uh, the phenology calendar and in validating the results that we get from the metabarcoding, we wanna make sure that things that are blooming are 
actually blooming at that particular time. I mean, it's a really great resource, and hopefully you've, you've shared the link where you can actually, uh, based on the growing degree days that have accumulated for a particular year, you can predict what will be blooming on a particular day, date, um, just, just based on the weather to that date in the year. Um, so it's a really valuable resource for helping beekeepers or, or anyone interested in when different things are blooming uh, to, to validate what, what's blooming at a particular, on a particular day. Um, a really useful resource. We did use it. And it's, it's a great thing for those of you that are in Ohio and can put in an Ohio zip code into that, uh, that calculator to figure out what's blooming at a particular time. Great. And I'll put a link to that uh, calendar on our webpage as well. So folks can go in there and, and take a look at that. Uh, let's see. So um, there was a question about um, other factors or maybe the most important factors that limit the sustainability of, of honeybee uh, hives in an urban environment. Maybe you could just kind of summarize. Um. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think if you're looking to, to produce honey, urban environments can be, can be, dip, can be challenging. Um, but I think there's other reasons people, people keep bees. Uh, I, I mean, they're, they're extremely interesting organisms. And I think many people that keep them in urban environments view them as pets, um, where you can, uh, you know, go out and, and interact with this animal and kind of get a, a view of the natural environment that you wouldn't get through, you know, working with any other animal. Um, I will caution against people putting too many honeybee colonies in a particular area because obviously resources can be limiting for honeybees uh, in particular areas, in, in, in particularly in urban areas. Um, so you don't want to overstock your apiary. I think a couple of colonies is probably the right number uh, to have in a particular site so that you're not uh, making those bees compete too much with each other or you know, potentially out competing all the other you know, nectar and pollen feeders that are out there that need to get some food as well. Um, I guess future research will determine whether uh, these honeybees are actually a detriment to other urban, urban pollinators or not. Certainly at high densities, the, the bees will become a detriment to each other, the honeybees will, um, and will outcompete, will be competing with, you know, colonies will be, be competing with each other and will not be as productive or have as successful, not be as, as successful over the long term. So keep your numbers down would be my, my advice. Keep a, a couple colonies is a, is a good number. Okay. Uh, Robert asks about treatments for emerald ash borer and whether there are effects on um, honeybees. And I know that you found some interesting um, uh, details about ash in your research. So, yeah, this is, again, a, a case where nobody thought that honeybees were foraging on ash pollen. But, you know, we did this metabarcoding and... There it is, ash DNA in bee collected pollen. So honeybees do collect ash pollen. Um, it's, it's unknown really how much of those emerald ash borer pesticide, insecticide treatments get into the pollen. I've done a little bit of work in that area and it, it's clear that there is some insecticide residue present uh, in the pollen that bees could collect from ash trees. <laughs> But whether it's enough to actually cause harm to, to the bees is, is unknown. It wasn't a, a large concentration in the ash pollen. Um, I guess a bigger concern is that as the ash trees are dying, um, that's one less pollen source for the bees. And, and maybe they need that. I, I don't know. There's lots of different trees that are blooming in the springtime. Maybe they'll just switch over to maples or oaks if the ash are not available. Um, but there, there, it certainly is some risk from those insecticide treatments to, to bees through the, the pollen uh, that they're collecting from treated ash trees. Okay. There are a couple questions around CCD and maybe you can give us a, a two or three sentence kind of, of update of where we are with CCD and whether diversity of forage is a, a piece of that, a piece of bee health or your opinion on that. Oh, colony collapse disorder, CCD. This, this is what I, I wrote my PhD dissertation on. Um, regrettably, we have not solved it. Um, yeah, it's, it's not really clear. I think, I think CCD was probably more driven by a virus or Varroa mite interaction. I think it was a biotic, uh, issue within the colony. Um, obviously forage is going to be very, very greatly between different sites. Um, one thing that the beekeepers know is that if you keep your bees well-fed, they're more likely to overcome all of these other challenges that honeybees face. So having abundant floral 
resources in the environment will help bees overcome you know, disease challenges or pesticide challenges. Having lots of food will, will make all the prob other problems less damaging. So forage is really, really important um, for keeping honeybees and all bees healthy because they need food to survive. So more forage will help them overcome CCD. I don't think it was a cause of CCD, but I think it could potentially be a solution to the, the you know, poor health of, of many honeybees in, in the United States today. Okay, uh, Matthew wonders if obstructions in urban areas are an issue for honeybee foraging, you know, buildings and other, other uh, obstructions. I mean, so, so honeybees could easily fly over a lot of obstructions. I, th I think the, the big problem in urban areas is that everything is so patchy. You know, it's not a big field of, of alfalfa or a field of clover or a field of soybean. They have to work a lot harder to find those, those sources because of the obstructions, because of the small patch size. Um, the waggle dance is not much of an advantage if the patch of flowers is really small and you're not recruiting hundreds or thousands of bees to go visit it. So I, I think it's, it's the obstructions and it's the just generally patchy nature of the urban environment that is possibly contributing to the, the uh, you know, the, the less honey pr that's produced in urban environments, just because the honeybees biology is not as well suited to that kind of patchy environment. Okay. Let's end with Beth's question. She wonders if honeybees prefer non-native plants. Well, there were certainly a number of non-native plants on that uh, on that list. You know, the clovers are not native. Um, goldenrod is native, and, and bees love goldenrod. Um, I mean, honeybees are native to to Europe. Our our honeybees here are so they do forage on a lot of European species, um, and maybe that's one argument that they are not competing with native species because native species should be foraging on, on native plants, um, and and the honeybees really like these these introduced things. Um, All right, great. Well, thanks, Reed. We really appreciate your time this morning and, um, and sharing your uh, email address as well. Folks, if you had a question you want to follow up with Reed, um, you'll also want to check out our webpage and, um, and see the links to some of Reed's uh, papers out there. And I put the, the uh, link there in the chat box, you, the last one there. You can grab that link. And um, thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you tomorrow. If you've signed up to, uh, to join us every day this week at uh, 10 o'clock, we'll be here talking about pollinators in the city. So thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Reed. Thanks.